Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And today, I am excited to be joined by Douglas McKee, who's the Executive Director of Threat Research at SonicWall. And we are going to walk through SonicWall's 2024 Mid-Year Cyber Threat Report, which has a ton of great information in it. Doug, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and be able to talk about some of the latest things we're seeing in our report. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, this is a rapidly evolving space. And um, I, I personally, I mean, I'm kind of a, a major nerd and I'm kind of have the feeling, I don't know you very well, but I'm kind of have the feeling that perhaps you are as well. And, you know, I, there just couldn't be a more interesting time to be in the security space than right now. And I will say that many of my friends in the cybersecurity space often say it's exciting and terrifying. It depends Absolutely. on what it depends on what hour you ask that question, right? So this year's report, it takes a look at the evolving threat landscape over the first five months of 2024. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, and you hear this if you are part of our viewing and listening audience on a regular basis. I mean, the, the report um, says exactly uh, many of the things that we talk about here on a regular basis, and it paints a rather concerning picture of today's cybersecurity environment, which is, should be no surprise to anyone. One of the most striking revelations to me as I parsed through the report was really the sheer volume and the frequency of cyber attacks that are occurring. Again, I know that it's happening, but yet sometimes when you see those numbers, it's just like, holy moly. Um, from the report, SonicWall sensors detected attack activity for 125% of a standard 40 hour work week. That means there are essentially 50 hours of critical attacks that are happening in the space of 40 working hours. Um, this is why CISOs don't sleep very well. Um, <laughs> This translates to organizations enduring an average of 1,104 hours of critical attacks during 880 working hours. So uh, there is absolutely not enough time in the day to deal with all this. And, and another thing that I think that is interesting, certainly to kick off this conversation, is what this means from a financial standpoint. The Sonic Wall report showed that at a minimum, 12.6% of all revenues are exposed, all corporate revenues, let me, <laughs> let me emphasize that, are exposed to thr cyber threats without proper protection. The Sonic Wall report showcased this stat and extrapolated that out to provide an example of the financial risk that organizations face. So for a $10 million company, that equates to a potential risk of 1.2 million as a result of a cyber attack. Um, now that we've got your attention <laughs> on the financial risk point, let's dive in more fully. Doug, you ready? Absolutely, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so the report introduces a new metric that ties attacks to tangible business act, uh, impact, which I just spoke to a little bit. But will you walk me through that? I'm really curious about this new metric. Yeah, absolutely. I love to. In fact, it's one of the things I'm the most excited about in this new report. You know, the, the threat landscape is evolving. Uh, we have to evolve our technology, things like AI, machine learning. And so we want to make sure that our metrics and the way we're talking about cybersecurity aligns with all that involvement. Right. Yeah. And we've spent a lot of time. This that metrics actually been in the works for the last several years and trying to, you know, hone in on it and craft it. And and what we're doing is we're, we're measuring attacks, equating for for time and frequency. So I think one of the best ways that I can uh, think about this is if I told you we were going to measure rain, okay, and you went out, would you count the raindrops or would we talk about the amount of rainfall, right, over a given period of time? Yeah. So that's the way to think of our new metric is raindrops, there's different sizes, you know, some are bigger, some are smaller, they hit in different places. But at the end of the day, when it comes to weather, we're like, oh, there's been an inch worth of rain over the last couple of hours or last 30 minutes. And that's kind of how we approached measuring this new metric in our, our report. So we're talking about the amount of tax over a given amount of, amount of time, or in this case, an hour, right? right. And what's really cool and, and what you highlighted is hour has value. Time has a value to it. Right. And so this is where we decided, well, we can take 
the average revenue a company makes within within a day and that allows us to assign a value of if you couldn't make money for that specific hour if, if a cyber attack prevented you from producing that revenue that you've reported for an hour what does that cost and that's kind of and you mentioned the stat 12.6 percent it's important to note that that's only in the first five months so that's <laughs> trending on almost 30 percent a year right right you, you map that out yeah that's well that's a very good qualifier but i think you know from a from a business development standpoint and from an industry awareness standpoint, I love metrics like that because to me, that is a really solid indicator of exactly the risk that businesses face. And I think sometimes when we talk about, you know, the rise in cyber attacks and the risk, some of it's just sort of, you know, is undefined ephemeral risk, right? But I mm -hmm. love the way that you've kind of dialed into these metrics and made it something that literally is an equation that helps people kind of understand what their risk really is. And we, what we've done is we've been very transparent about how we've come up with those numbers. So that way uh, people can, you know, respectfully agree or disagree. And that's in the yeah. report. So you can see how we're doing that and you can leverage that for the best the best use of, of your risk. And one of the things I'll highlight talking about risk and, and numbers is the, the numbers we've created are the minimum risk due to downtime. So a lot of reports will come out and say like, the average cost of a ransomware attack, for example, is X millions about a dollars, right? I actually think it's in billions at, at, at this point. Right. In time. We're only calculating downtime. So if you think about, okay, any mitigation strategy that you'd have to do or financial loss to your image or all that stuff that goes on top of it, that's oh, on gosh. top of the numbers. That's on top of the numbers that we're reporting. This is yeah. just risk of revenue from, from downtime. Yeah, crazy, crazy. So let's talk malware for a minute. There has been, your report indicated there's been a 30% spike in mal malware volume over the course of the last five months, obviously indicating malware continues to be a very attractive and primary tool for cyber criminals. Any thoughts on malware in terms of what you're hearing from customers and from your industry peers on that front? And you know, is maybe AI playing a role here? You know, Malware, like everything else in the threat landscape, is, is continuously changing. In fact, another stat from the report is we've seen 536 new variants of malware on yeah. average a day, right? Yeah. And that also speaks to the uh, the volume of increasing malware. And I think we're always going to see uh, cyber threat actors leverage malware. It's it's a it's a tool in their tool belt that is known to work, yeah. right? And that that's going to cause them to lean towards it. Of course. Uh, you know, is AI a factor? That's that's part of uh, what, what everyone wants to talk about is is AI. And it, it definitely plays a component when we talk about something that we sometimes call like script kitties, which basically means uh, basically means bad actors that don't necessarily have a super advanced knowledge, but they're able to run a simple script and then execute that problem. Yeah. Uh, AI has definitely allowed for more of that as you can leverage AI to help you in development or create malware uh, at a much faster clip without necessarily needing that deep technical understanding. But I also want to I want to pump the brakes on that a little bit. You know, AI is not at a point currently that it can just go write me a super advanced piece of malware and you know hit enter and you get this super advanced piece of malware right there's right. there's a lot that goes into that there's still knowledge needed from the the human sitting behind the keyboard uh is, is all part of that component yeah yeah well and i think you know we do talk a lot in the industry as a whole about ai and you know, in terms of AI for security and security for AI, they're two very different things. And, you know, I think that part of what we're seeing is that, you know, just like many of us are using different um, Gen AI tools to experiment with, to do different things, um, threat actors are too. And their incentive is that they're highly motivated because they have financial rewards if they're able to figure this out. So I think that that experimentation is happening on the AI front. I think it's helping them sort of fine tune some of their campaigns and and uh, it'll be interesting to watch this play out for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I often have to remind people, I said, it's not only the bad guys using AI, <laughs> right? You know, the good guys are using AI too. I think the way you put it as far as experimental going back for us is 100% what's happening. Yeah. And, I mean, that's you know, what we're doing. We're all doing absolutely. that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we're seeing it on both sides. We're seeing yeah. the advancements in the, in the defensive side of it, and yeah. we're seeing it in the offensive side. And it'll be very interesting to see how this goes, uh, you know, moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So much like malware, ransomware continues to be a lovely treat in the threat actors basket. And and I noticed, though, from the report, I thought this was particularly interesting, that threat actors are now using what you're calling geographically tailored attacks. And that, of course, will, so I, I want to unpack what that is. And then, of course, you know, it's also going to require CISOs and their teams to develop geographically tailored cybersecurity strategies, which is something that we don't talk about, I feel like, enough. So will you maybe share with us a little bit about these geographically tailored attacks and, and some of the findings of the report? On yeah, the uh, in, in the context of ransomware, uh, we see we saw a pretty diverse across the globe change in, in numbers. So like in North America, we saw about a 15 percent increase. And of course, when we say increase. We're saying year over year. So we compare yeah. the 2023 first half with the, the first half of, of 2024. Okay. Uh, so we saw a 15 percent increase in, in North America. And then we saw a 51 percent increase in Latin America. Uh, so we saw a, a very large increase there. And other parts of the globe, you know, some had a decline, right? Some had 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 a, had an increase. I think what's important about geographical tailored attacks is, is the way that you put it is there are different security maturities that have occurred in different parts of the globe, which allow them to uh, be prepared for some attacks and not necessarily prepared for others. And as yeah. the security landscape matures in those different areas, you're going to see attackers shift to take advantage of that. Right. Uh, and I also think that it's it's really important that while we report geographic metrics to remember that business is a, a global enterprise now, almost yeah. any business is a global enterprise. Yeah. And sometimes it's just simply about hitting their target where they are at that time or where yeah. they can where the where the servers are, where the users are. So as we as we hire in different geos, then we see malware attacking those different geos, right? And it's it's a constant struggle and challenge to really protect this global business or organization that we have versus oh we've got all our eggs in you know North America and it's easy right. to kind of build a, a system around. That's not the way the world works anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the things that always fascinates me is when we talk about IoT and connected devices and security as it relates to them, those devices. And I think that an ordinary average human being really doesn't spend much, if any time, thinking about the fact that most of us are surrounded by connected devices on a daily basis at work and at home. Our routers, our TVs, our refrigerators, our smart lights, our smart doorbells, our kids' toys, so many, our printers, so many things, so many endpoints, so many endpoints, so little time. Um, but then when you, okay, great. So you're right, Shelly, we're surrounded by a lot of things at home. Okay, then take it out into the business world, into those office buildings that again have you know, uh, smart building controls at the ready. So you walk into a conference room, the light goes on, the light goes off when you leave, those sorts of things. Um, think about a hospital. Think about when you go to a doctor's visit, a specialist visit or things like that, and you're getting, you know, they're using internet connected machines, sonograms or those sorts of things to do diagnostic tests. All of those things are connected to the internet. They are endpoints that are incredibly attractive to threat actors. And, and so that is why the IoT continues to be an attractive target. Also, you know, think about manufacturing, industrial facilities, that sort of thing. They're filled with uh, things that are connected to the internet. And, and by the way, these connected devices are continuing to grow at an incredibly rapid pace, and that's not going to slow down anytime soon. So one of the things that your report highlighted is that IoT attacks surged by about 107%. Um, I know that probably wasn't surprising to you. It certainly wasn't surprising to me. But let's talk a little bit, if we can, about the vulnerability of connected devices. 
I think you outlined it, you know, quite beautifully as far as the the amount of connected devices that we have. I mean, even personally in my house, I look at my network and I have 60 connected devices. I live in, I, you know, I don't live in a mansion, right? I live in a three bedroom house and I've got you know, only two kids. So, you know, that's a lot of connected devices. That's and, a lot. You know, we're, we're seeing, you know, in, in the medical industry, uh, I, you know, a lot of more, as you indicated, a lot of connected devices in a past life. I did a lot of vulnerability research into medical devices, building controllers, all that fun stuff. And I think uh, what's what's interesting about what we've highlighted in this report is not just in the context of IoT. So we've actually highlighted in 2024, the first half of it, the top five most widespread attacks in, in general. So this is across IoT, across all attacks, affecting the most of our customers and partners. In that top five, three of them are IoT devices, right? And, yeah. and I think that just speaks to, yes, there's a 100% seven increase, but it also speaks to how widespread this is. And yeah. I often get the question, why? Why is that the case? And I think there's several factors that, that go into that. Yeah. Uh, one is, let's not forget that the standard desktop environment, the standard mobile environment, especially when you look at things like Windows, has actually gotten quite challenging uh, from an end-to-end -end exploitation uh, perspective. Uh, not definitely not impossible. Doug did not say that, right? I said it's it's increasing in, in difficulty. Yeah. Uh, so I often joke that hackers are lazy, you know, and they're going to trend towards the thing that is uh, the most simplistic <laughs> or right the easiest, the lowest them. hanging fruit. Yeah, to get to get exactly to get that bang for your buck, right? Like you said earlier, they're financially motivated. Right. How do I get the most money, right? Right. Uh, return on investment. So I think IoT is still that sweet spot for them. And then you couple the fact that right. it's in manufacturing, it's in the medical field where they're where you're seeing payouts for these things. It's going to increase the activity that we see. Yeah. Well, and the thing too that a lot of times people don't think about, and I, I mean, I this has been top of mind for me for years, um, but that security has got to be integrated as a foundational step in the development of any piece of software or hardware. And, and that, you know, that is sort of the gospel that, that analysts preach and that security pros preach and everything else. But in many instances, when people are developing, you know, the latest children's toy or, you know, whatever, some smart device that I have in my home or my office, a lot of times they're, they don't understand the importance of security from a foundational standpoint. They're not starting there. They're not building it in. They're not worrying about that. And that creates a problem for the rest of us. Yeah, I think there's a couple a couple things packed packed into that, right? To to explore. One is uh, at RSA, I I did a session. It's called a Birds of a Feather session, which means it's it's not me presenting, but it's more of like a general conversation with with small businesses. And one of the things that came up is the number one thing that they struggle with is ensuring that cybersecurity is a C-suite issue. Yes, which goes to exactly what you're talking about, which is are these products being designed from the even from the highest executive level with the fact that we have awareness that security needs to be a key component. So right. I definitely think that is something uh, to think about. But on the flip side of that coin, and I think something that is often missed is a lot of these IoT devices, while we're getting new devices, there's two, two issues there. One, is they're often built on older technology. Yeah. And that older technology was never designed to be network connected. So yeah. the original architects, we see a lot of this in the medical industry, right? Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, someone built an infusion pump, and when they built it, their threat modeling didn't include being network yeah. connected, right? Yeah. And now a manufacturer comes in and straps on a, a network card, and it's on the internet. And that's kind of where we have to be careful is, has the, the technology been designed and threat modeled to be yeah. an internet or network connected device? Yeah, yeah. Valid point. Very valid point. So let's talk now about encrypted threats. And this is another area that the report highlighted, um, you know, the rise in encrypted th threats jumped, you know, a small little 92%. Um, obviously, to me, this indicates that threat actors are becoming more sophisticated, likely aided in many instances by AI, which is not, you know, AI isn't changing the game completely as it re relates to this. But I remain convinced that just as we are 
in our daily lives, not everybody is, but in our daily lives, experimenting with, exploring with how we can use generative AI to help us, you know, be more productive, be more accurate and efficient and all that sort of thing. Threat actors are doing that too. So, um, so these encrypted threats, they're using encryption to avoid detection. Um, but 92%, that's crazy. What does that tell, you know, what does this increase tell you um, that organizations need to focus on and do to stay safe from these kind of threats? I, th I think it talks to a, a couple points. Uh, one is, as, as you said, like it's malware is getting more sophisticated, right? Yeah. So as as a result of that, we're seeing encryption used. But why is encryption being used? We can we can think about it as well. That means that unencrypted malware is not yeah. working as often, right? So attackers are moving to a, a, a new. I don't want to say new because it's not new, but yeah. a, a different. Pivoting. <laughs> yeah, they're pivoting to a different approach, and and uh, encryption is well known to help in the invasion of uh, security vendors' tools or, or defensive technology. Yeah, so that's that's definitely a key a key driver for for the switch into encrypted threats, uh, and and what it means really from a defensive perspective or a detect perspective is we have to have visibility into that traffic, right? Or we have to have visibility into those type of threats. How do we do that? A lot of security tools on the market have the capability to be decrypting this information. That's how we get it, right? right. From, from our firewalls and our vendors is they have that capability. So it's really important that your security tools are configured to handle properly encrypted threats to be able to okay. doing that detection. Because if the attackers are upping their ante to move to that direction, then it means it's still getting them past yeah. uh, things, which often means we need to make sure that our we're configuring our tools correctly. Yeah. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So I noted that the report covered something that piqued my curiosity in the never before seen mal malware variants. What are they? How do you find them? And what does this mean for the industry as a whole? Simply never before seen in our context means that our, our detection engines before before that piece of malware was captured, we hadn't seen a variant just yeah. like it. We hadn't yeah. seen that exact thing. So it's, it's, there's a there's a slight caveat there, right? Never seen before doesn't mean it's never been used anywhere in the world. It just means that we haven't seen it within our sensors before. Got it. Right. And so where where do we get that? We get that data directly from from our sensors as one primary place. We also, uh, like many security vendors, leverage the open source community. We leverage things like Virus Total to make sure that we are properly create proactively creating detection. So even if it hasn't been seen by our sensors, right? That we're trying to create detections for it as, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it could potentially play a little bit into the AI conversation. Why are we seeing so many new variants? Well, it's difficult for AI to, nece to not necessarily write a brand new, super sophisticated piece of malware from the ground zero. It's much simpler for someone to provide a piece of code to, to AI and say, hey, could you modify this just a little bit? Could you do this same thing slightly differently? And all of a sudden, they do that a bunch of times within a large piece of malware. Now you have something that looks completely different than when we started. Yeah. Uh, and that can be uh, potentially a reason why we're seeing uh, additional uh, new threats on a regular basis. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, and I will note, you know, as we're talking about this, the data point from your report was that 78 thousand new malware variants were identified in the first five months alone of 2024, which is an average of 526 new strains daily. That's a quite lot. A bit. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite a bit. <laughs> that is quite a bit. That's quite a bit. So Doug, one of the things that we talk about here incessantly is the rapidly evolving cybersecurity threat landscape. Of course, you know, when we talk about this, it's, it's, it is a reality in our world. And the reality is also that that is not going to slow down. I mean, you know, all of the advancements in the tech sector that we've seen over the course of the last five and 10 years, you know, everything has sped up. And so this also, you know, is not surprising that we've seen this threat landscape um, speed up and, and challenges kind of come winging at us faster than ever before, but that's not going to change. Um, certainly it's not going to change significantly. And so as we wrap this show, what I'm looking for from you is what's your best advice 
to organizations who might be reading this report um, to their CISOs and their IT teams, you know, how do, how do you think about this moving forward? And, you know, everything that we've touched on here is just an escalation in malware and an escalation in ransomware and an escalation in never before seen threats and all of these things. How do they, how do they effectively combat this ever evolving cyber threat landscape? I think that's a great question. It's it's always the elephant in the room, right? Yeah. Like how do we how do we get better? What do we how do, do? We create, how do we stay on top of it? And I think there's a multi-phase approach here. I, I think my number one advice to CISOs or to organizations out there is don't try to do it alone. Yeah. And I think that's often the time where we we see mistakes. Oh, we can handle this. We can just hire a couple more people, right? You know, yeah. the hours that we talked about in the beginning, there's more attack hours happening than there is in your average work week. You know, leveraging a, a partner to or a SOC to do 24 seven monitoring is is really key in making sure that, that you're protected uh, around the clock, 365. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to try to do that alone, it, it's a noble cause, but it's gonna cost you more. And that's the biggest thing we have to do is we, and it, it also comes in a different context. And that is don't rely on only your data. You know, we published this threat report to make sure that you are aware of what we're seeing at SonicWall from a threat perspective. Right. But I'd be ignorant to say that well, only our data matters, right? Make sure right. you're reading uh, the threat reports from other companies that are focusing on different verticals. Make sure you understand what's specific to your industry. Uh, data, powers in, data empowers decisions. It's really important right. that you're staying on top of that. So I, I think those... Those two things are, are high on my list is don't try to do this alone. Make sure that you have some 24 seven monitoring place and make sure that you're informed. Yeah. You know what? I think that makes it, it really tracks with the advice that I give on a regular basis. And, you know, part of what I like to say is that, you know, we have so many challenges as it relates to the IT sector, you know, talking about staffing and, and really highly skilled um, tech team members. That's a challenge. It can, it remains a challenge. Actually, that's one of the benefits of, you know, integrating and embracing AI, because in many ways that's helping teams um, kind of carry a little bit of the workload. Um, but it is so, you know, we've got the skills gap. That's a challenge. We've got this rapidly evolving threat. We've got the, you know, the advent of Gen AI, which is good and terrible in a variety of different ways. It's good that we're able to use it in some ways and that will continue to evolve. Threat actors, of course, are, are diving in and, and trying to maximize their financial returns as a result. So it's just a really, really interesting time. But the other thing that I think is really important that you hit on is that the, the, it is so strategically smart to work with trusted vendor partners. This is rarely something, it, this is a sophisticated threat landscape. It's growing more sophisticated um, every day. And this is just something that most organizations really don't have the chops to do internally. And that's where turning to trusted vendor partners. And generally speaking, there's more than one in the security stack that we work with and, you know, we as organizations work with. And so I think that's really good advice. Don't, don't feel like you have to carry this burden alone if you're a CISO or an IT pro. Um, and, and I think also communicating that to your C-suite and to your board is important, you know? Absolutely. C couldn't, yeah. couldn't agree more. Yeah, give me the budget dollars I need to protect this company <laughs> and don't argue about it. Well, Doug McKee, Executive Director of Threat Research at SonicWall, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of The Security Angle, um, for sharing insights from SonicWall's 2024 mid-year cyber threat report. I will be sure and link that report to our viewers and our listeners in my show notes. But it's been wonderful chatting through this with you, Doug. And, and I will also say, you know, I, I'll end on, the, uh, on your comment about reading. You know, we have so much data at our fingertips. Read reports. And that's one of the reasons you know, I saw this report come out and I thought, you know what, I'm going to have him on and we're going to talk about it. So I appreciate you making time for me today. It's been amazing, a great conversation. And the report is packed with great information for our 
viewers and listeners, if you haven't yet hit that subscribe button, do it. And uh, again, this is Shelley Kramer coming to you from the Cube Research and uh, the Cube. And we are here to serve you and keep you informed. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you so much.